The International Council on Biblical Inerrancy, ICBI, held what was called its first summit conference on October 26 to 28, 1978. It was, it was held at the Hyatt Regency O'Hare Hotel outside of Chicago, which even today is a strikingly beautiful building. There were 279 participants and the conference lasted for three days. Now, I was a 30-year-old young faculty member. I was still five months away from receiving my PhD. I had no publication record that justified my presence at the conference at all. But I knew the president of Westminster Seminary, Edmund Clowney, and I heard this conference was going to happen, and I phoned him and asked if he could get me an invitation, and he did, and I went. The um, conference was fascinating, and um, I'm doing a lot of this from memory, although I still have the three-ring three binder notebook of papers, position papers that were discussed during the conference and the list of all the participants. Now, my definition of inerrancy and my explanation of it, a brief form. Um, inerrancy doctrine, the inerrancy of scripture means that scripture in the original manuscripts does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. In other words, it's truthful. What it says is true. That's the heart of the issue of inerrancy. Psalm 12, 6, the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. You heat the furnace up and skim off the dross from the silver, and you have pure silver, but it's not quite pure, so you heat it again. And you just skim off some more dross, and you heat it a third time and a fourth time. And seven times, is, seven is what in scripture? completion or for perfection. So it's, the words of the Lord are pure words like um, silver that is perfectly purified. There's no, there's no dross in it. There's no impurity in it. That's what the words of the Lord are. 30, Proverbs, Proverbs 30 verse 5, every word of God proves true. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. Or Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie. And um, Titus 1, 2, it is impossible for God to lie. Uh, no, the God who, who does not lie, apsustes theos, the unlying God. And in Hebrews, it says that it is impossible for God to lie. Lying is contrary to God's character, and it's impossible for him to speak untruthfulness. This definition does not mean the Bible tells us every fact there is to know about any one subject, but it affirms that what it does say about a subject is true. For instance, we read in, Acts, in Amos 5.8 <clears throat> about the constellations Pleiades and Orion. He who made the Pleiades and Orion and turns deep darkness into the morning and darkens the day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth, the Lord is his name. Now, it doesn't tell us how hot those stars are, how far from us they are, how old they are, what color they are. It tells us God made them. That's true doesn't tell us everything about those stars. Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. It doesn't tell us exactly how God created the universe, but it says that he created it. The Bible could be inerrant and still speak in the ordinary language of everyday speech. This is important because a number of questions with inerrancy come up, uh, uh, arise because the writer is speaking from the perspective of the speaker. So for instance, James 1.11, the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. From, if you're watching the sunrise, from your perspective, the sun does rise. It doesn't say there's some fixed point in the middle of the universe compared to which the sun is moving, the earth is spinning around its axis or not. It doesn't say anything about that. It's just speaking from the perspective of the speaker. It's observational description. Inerrancy has to do with truthfulness, not with the degree of precision with which events are repeated. This sentence is true. I live seven miles from Scottsdale Bible Church. Now, what if it's actually 7.24 miles? Even that is a rounded, rounded number, 7.24578 miles. How about millimeters? <laughs> Um, the degree of accuracy in such matters is the degree of accuracy intended and implied by the speaker and understood by the hearer. 
some combination of those. And so if 24,000 or 23,000 died in a battle, maybe some died the next day, there, it means it's not 45,000, but it's the degree of accuracy implied by the speaker and understood by the hearer. The Bible can be inerrant and still include loose or free quotations. What did you say your name is? Charlie. And Charlie says to me, the dinner line is open. And I say to, what's your name? Uh, Jessica. Jessica. Um, Charlie said it's time to eat. And Charlie said that, that uh, supper is, begin, is beginning. I'm not quoting his exact words. I'm saying it's what we call indirect speech in English. Charlie said that, and I tell you a summary of it. We get a lot of that in the quotations of Jesus' sayings in different Gospels, where it's accurate representation of what he said, but it may not be the exact words. It's consistent with inerrancy to have unusual or uncommon grammatical constructions in the Bible. Is it possible to have a person who has poor grammar but always tells the truth? Of course it is. Some of the uh, biblical writers are highly trained and academically competent. Others are just ordinary people, shepherds, uh, agricultural people. And um, inerrancy doesn't necessarily mean their style, their Hebrew or Greek style is uh, the most wonderful level as possible. It just has, inerrancy means that what they say is true. Is it possible to always tell the truth but be a poor speller? You can't spell the right word, you can't spell words correctly. Yes. Now, I believe some of you may know more about Islam than I do, but I think that Muslims say that the Quran is perfect in its spelling and its grammar and everything. We don't need to go there. What we want to affirm is that the Bible is true. It's truthful. And if there are variations in spelling of different words, uh, that's not an error. That's just a variation in spelling, but you know what the word is anyway. Impressions of the influence of the Chicago Statement. I was a young faculty member at the undergraduate school, Bethel College in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I went to the conference, but no, but there's a college and then there's a master's degree program in Bethel Seminary. And no faculty member from Bethel Seminary was invited or went to the conference for some reason. As soon as the conference was over, the president of Bethel College and Seminary, Carl Lundquist, was worried that it would, be, it would appear that nobody at the seminary believed in inerrancy, or some people didn't anyway. So he quickly phoned J.I. Packer and asked Packer to quickly come to Bethel and explain the Chicago Statement so we could all sign it <laughs> or affirm it. And I began to see there's a, a restraining effect on institutions because the statement had such widespread support from the beginning. I was rejoicing because of the Chicago Statement. My first year in seminary was at Fuller Seminary in Pasadena, California. And I was surprised when I got there that I was hearing in classes that there's a historical mistake here, there's a historical mistake there, but it doesn't matter. The spiritual message is true. Um, it's, it's, it's infallible in faith and practice, but maybe there's some historical error. For instance, one of my professors said, Luke recorded Gamaliel's speech incorrectly in Acts. But it doesn't matter because the punchline is true. That's if it's from God, you can't oppose it. And if it's a man, it'll fail. Even though Luke made a mistake in getting these revolutionaries, Judas and Thutis, in the wrong order. But it doesn't matter. And uh, another professor said, Jesus said the mustard seed is the smallest of seeds but actually orchid seeds are smaller. So he's not truthful, but he, was make, he, he didn't want to interrupt the teaching. He, he just used it to, make, to communicate a central truth about faith. And another professor said, you know where it says that John the Baptist looked at Jesus and said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Well, he couldn't have said that that early. He couldn't have known it that early. John just put it in, just put it in there for literary purposes or something. 
And I began to accumulate these examples of faculty members saying that this little part of scripture and this little part of scripture and this little part of scripture is not true. And I left Fuller Seminary and went to Westminster in Philadelphia where the, the faculty was of holding inerrancy. But I, I kind of argued my way through my first year at seminary at faculty. Argued with faculty members. And then at Bethel College when I was teaching, various um, faculty members were, were giving less esteem to the scripture by departments outside the Bible and theology department. Looking back on my, after I finished Westminster Seminary, I went to Cambridge for a PhD in New Testament. And my confidence in the truthfulness of scripture was increased by my time at Cambridge. My supervisor, Professor Mole, I, I, my topic for, to, for dissertation was the gift of prophecy in 1 Corinthians. So my supervisor, Professor Mole, wanted me to write a paper on the nature of prophecy in the Old Testament. So I did, and I, reported just many, many, many verses that said, these are the words of the Lord, thus says the Lord. And that was a standard formula where the words of the king were proclaimed in the ancient world, ko amar Yahweh, thus says the Lord. And uh, I argued in the paper that the Old Testament view of prophecy is that it, the prophet is speaking God's very words. And my supervisor, Professor Mole, gracious, man that he was, said, well, I guess that's what it does say, doesn't it? <laughs> but my, my confidence in the truthfulness of scripture was increased. And then I was at Tyndall House. Simon is here from Tyndall House. Um, and people would bring up various alleged errors in scripture, mistakes in scripture. Uh, what do you do about this verse? What do you do about that verse? And I began to look them up and study them. and. I found that there were answers to all of these alleged errors. So my confidence in the truthfulness of scripture increased. When I got back from the Chicago conference, I brought the Chicago statement to my theology class and began to put apart, put, give attention to it in lectures. And then in 1981, which is three years later, I moved to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Deerfield, Illinois and kept on teaching about the Chicago Statement in, in my class on scripture. And in 1994, I published a book called Systematic Theology, and I put in the back of the book an appendix with the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedonian Creed, the 39 Articles of the Church of England, Westminster Confession of Faith, Baptist Faith and Message, and the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. Nobody complained about it. After the Chicago Statement was written, there began to be wider acceptance of the Chicago Statement in the evangelical world. The Evangelical Theological Society in 2004 adopted it as, as our explanation of what our affirmation of faith means. When it says the Bible is without, I don't have the exact word, it is without error in the original manuscripts or something to that effect. The Bible alone and the Bible in its entirety is the word of God written and without error in the original manuscripts. Um, but the ETS adopted it as, as our official explanation. Other parachurch organizations, the Gospel Coalition, the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals, and several others, then denominations, began to have clear affirmations of inerrancy or to strengthen their affirmations of inerrancy. Uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, Evangelical Free Church, Evangelical Presbyterian Church, Presbyterian Church in America, Assemblies of God, many other Bible churches and non-denominational churches. Educational institutions began to adopt the Chicago Statement, Moody Bible Institute, all six Southern Baptist seminaries, Westminster Seminary in California and in Philadelphia, Master Seminary, Dallas Seminary, Trinity Evang International University, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, Wheaton College, etc., etc. Now, some of them used their own wording, but they affirmed inerrancy. So the, the term and the concept was uh, gained increasing acceptance and recognition. 
In my experience with faculty interviews, in 40, uh, 45 years of teaching, four years undergraduate and 41 years of teaching at, at a master's level, and sometimes at a PhD level at Trinity, I have probably participated in 100 faculty interviews, prospective faculty members, and it's very common to ask, do you agree with the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy? And if not, would you explain why? So it's become a kind of a, a test case. Broader results of the Chicago Statement and the conference. First, a reclaiming of the word inerrancy. As the primary term to be used in debates over the authority of scripture, um, there were a number of voices, and still today there are some who say, I don't, I don't feel comfortable with the word inerrancy. It seems too precise. Um, it implies scientific precision, which the Bible doesn't purport to have. And my response is, read the literature that's debated this issue. The, the uh, word inerrancy is clearly defined and explained. It has to do with just telling the truth. And it allows, in the literature going back to Warfield, at least, uh, it allows, as used in theological circles, it allows for loose or free quotations, for approxima approximations in numbers and counting and measuring, and things like that, ordinary language speech. Um, so when people say, I don't like to use the word inerrancy because it means X, Y, Z, which, which its advocates do not say that it means, I, th I think that's sort of like saying, like someone saying, I don't like the word Trinity because it implies three gods. Mm -hmm. My response is, no, if you read the Christian literature on the Trinity, it doesn't imply three gods. It includes the idea that there's one God and three persons. So you can, you can have your own definition of inerrancy, but it isn't consistent with this uh, Chicago statement anyway. So there was uh, a clear definition, and, bring, and, and it brought the word inerrancy back to the center of the discussion. And number two, there was a clear, thoughtful, responsible definition of inerrancy, and this was a standard against which other claims about the authority of Scripture could be evaluated. Supporters of inerrancy could now defend one position rather than dozens of varieties. And it seems to me there was a noticeable shift in the United States, which is the context I'm most familiar with. I don't know something about the UK. But in the United States, anyway, there was a, a, a shift in the atmosphere of evangelical scholarship. At last, after several years of vig vigorous debate, defenders of inerrancy held the high ground, and opponents of iner inerrancy, since they were in the minority, note the controversies over Robert Gundry's Matthew commentary, and over Clark Pinnock, Greg Boyd, and John Sanders' view of open theism, also the controversy at Westminster Seminary over Peter Enns, Old Testament faculty member who was let go. The controversy was no longer whether to accept inerrancy, but whether certain positions are consistent with inerrancy. I began to see a bandwagon effect where people were eager to jump on board and affirm the Chicago Statement, and the conference was in October. By January 1st, these other names were added, such as Hudson Armadink, former president of Wheaton, Don Carson, Robert Coleman, John Frame, Jack Hayford, Hal Lindsey, Robertson McQuilkin, Stephen Olford, Luis Palau, Eckhart Schnabel, Luther Whitlock, and many others began to publicly affirm the Chicago Statement. Now, what are the reasons for this wide influence? I, I think there are 12 reasons. I'll go through them quickly. Number one, God's favor and guidance on the entire project. There were times of worship and prayer at all six plenary sessions scattered over three days. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. Proverbs 21, 31. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. So God's favor. Number two, right timing. In 1976, two years earlier, Harold Linzel, a former faculty member of Fuller Seminary and editor of Christianity Today, subsequently, published a book called The Battle for the Bible, and it made an explosive effect on uh, evangelicalism because Harold Linzel went through different institutions, Fuller Seminary, Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, uh, North Park Seminary, and 
said what the, the faculty members were teaching, but it wasn't known to the, uh, their supporters and how they were denying the truthfulness of scripture and it created a huge controversy. But Linzel, he was courageous and he saw a problem and pu publicized it. But some of his explanations of problem verses in scripture were stretched and seemed artificial, like the circumference of the, the, the bath or the uh, laver in the temple area, the circumference is three times the diameter. And he had, if you take a measuring tape and measure the inside diameter of the, <laughs> of the item instead of the outside di diameter, you can get closer to three. And it seemed artificial to people. And he had six denials of Peter um, to re reconcile the apparent differences. There are better solutions than that. And so th th there was a controversy, but it was confusing as well. And so the, this is the right timing. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And it seems to me that the Holy Spirit was guiding the timing. Number three, high-level academic leadership by widely respected evangelical scholars from diverse denominations. There were six plenary session speakers, an Anglican J.I. Packer, a Lutheran Robert Preuss, president of Concordia Seminary, Fort Wayne, a Baptist W.A. Criswell, so one Anglican, one Lutheran, one Baptist, and three Presbyterians. <laughs> Edmund Clowney, James Montgomery Boyce, and R.C. Sproul. Fourteen position papers presented at workshops by respected evangelical scholars. So there was high-level academic leadership at that time. Then there was the right goal. The goal of the conference was not to convince people, not to convince people who opposed inerrancy, but to define inerrancy clearly for those who supported it and to unify them behind a cause. So only inerrancy supporters were invited. A conference together, an earlier conference had brought together both sides of the inerrancy controversy. In 1966, under the leadership of Harold Ockengay, the Wenham Conference on Scripture tried to resolve the controversy with all sides represented. It brought together 51 scholars for 10 days, 10 days. They argued with each other and there was no consensus that came out of it. So this conference, an ICBI conference in uh, 1978, was not to invite opponents of inerrancy and try to persuade them to change their minds. It was for supporters of inerrancy to define what it meant and unify behind it. Christian leaders who teach harmful doctrines seldom repent from their hardened positions. From the moment I stepped into the hotel where the conference registration was going on, I could feel the there was just a sense that no one from Fuller, everybody was looking around, no one from Fuller Seminary was invited. A number of their faculty members had opposed the idea of inerrancy and said, we don't need it, we can abandon it. From the moment the conference began, I felt the absence was strikingly evident and it spoke volumes. Titus 3.10 is for a person who stirs up division after warning him once or twice. I have nothing more to do with him. Number five, the right participants. There was a remarkably widespread evangelical participation, but no opponents of inerrancy. That is, there were Missouri Synod Lutherans and Assembly of God Pentecostals. There were Calvinists and Wesleyans, Presbyterians and Baptists. And one of the highlights for me was a man came up to me and said, my name is Hardy Steinberg. Are you related to Arden Grudem? And I said, yeah, that's my dad. He was a national executive directing Christian education in the Assemblies of God. And he said, your dad was my best boy boyhood friend. He'd grown up together with him in Assemblies of God Church in Minneapolis. But no Roman Catholics were there because they had a different view of scripture, a different view of its authority compared to church history, uh, and a different view of the source of its authority and the different view of the canon, and not anyone who denied inerrancy. But a widespread group of participants in an abundance of counselors, there is victory. I went through the list of 279 participants and tallied who they were. 34% were full professors, senior scholars at various seminaries, 38 from, from uh, seminary positions and 34 from college positions. 
Um, and then uh, down here, another 12% were junior faculty members, uh, assistant or associate profs. So 129 of the 279 were faculty members. President or executive director of a parachurch, or a parachurch staff, 64%. I'm sorry, 64, 23% were parachurch staff. Now, by parachurch staff, I mean people like Bill Bright, the president of Campus Crusade. He's widely influential, but he's parachurch staff in my county. Uh, but uh, 60 people were president or executive director, the decision maker in evangelical institutions, presidents of denominations, presidents of seminaries, etc. 17% pastors. This is something I regret. I didn't have anything to do with the invitation list, but there were only 14 international representatives. So it was a decidedly more American conference. But you could say it was a decidedly American controversy as well. That's where the battle was raging in the, pre in the Christian press. Um, 12 business persons, 10 students in seminary, one of whom was named J.P. Moreland, uh, four lawyers, and two doctors. So heavily weighted toward people who had significant influence in the evangelical world. A brief glance at some of the participants. I'll just read these names. M most of them are no longer alive, but anyway. Jay Adams, Brooks Alexander, Gleason Archer, Cal Beisner, James Montgomery Boyce, Bill Bright, Russ Bush, Edmund Clowney, Chuck Colson, Alan Coppage, W.A. Criswell, John Jefferson Davis, Norman Geisler, John Gerstner, Stan Gundry, Howard Hendricks, John Hughes, A. Wetherill Johnson, Walter Kaiser, Kenneth Conser, D. James Kennedy, Jay Kessler, Dennis Kinlaw, Tim LaHaye, Gordon Lewis, Harold Linzel, Josh McDowell, John MacArthur, Sam Moore, J.P. Moreland, Roger Nicole, Harold Ockengay, J.I. Packer, Edwin Palmer, Paige Patterson, Vern Poitras, Robert Preuss, Earl Rodmacher, Moshe Rosen, Charles Ryrie, Robert Sosi, Francis Schaefer, R.C. Sproul, Jerry Vines, Bruce Waltke, John Woodbridge, Edwin Yamauchi. Probably most of them are no longer alive. But if 279 respected evangelical leaders of this much influence unite behind a single cause, it will very likely gain widespread support. Number six, a sound process. The process provided a limited but genuine opportunity for the participation of every attendee. As a young professor in my second year of teaching, with my PhD still five months in the future, I still felt a valued part of the process. On Thursday, we arrived and we were given a draft of the statement. By Friday at 8 a.m., we had to turn in individual suggestions for rewording any phrases of the, sentence, of the statement. Friday at 12 o'clock noon, small group discussions of different portions of the revised document. Friday at 3 p.m., large group discussion of the revised document. And Saturday morning at 8 a.m., the final document was handed out. These suggestions went into a central steering committee of seven or eight or nine people. Um, but I think everybody felt a part of the process. I know I was in a, one of the small group breakout sessions and um, some Lutheran, Missouri Synod Lutheran leaders who had been active in Latin American missions said, we just, we can't say it's the Bible, we have to say the 66 books of the Bible because we want to make clear that we're not affirming a Roman Catholic view. And um, I could see the value of that and it got in. I had one contribution to the statement, one word. Article five, we affirm that God's revelation in the Holy Scriptures was progressive. That is, you learn more about topics as you go on. You learn more about the Trinity in the New Testament than in the Old Testament, for instance. We deny that later revelation, which may fulfill earlier revelation, ever contradicts, corrects or contradicts it. We further deny that any normative revelation has been given since the com completion of the New Testament writings. I had just finished a PhD on the gift of prophecy in 1 Corinthians. I knew that well, the, the, the statement as it came out didn't have the word normative in it. It just said, we further deny that any revelation has been given since the completion of the New Testament writings. And I happened to be sitting beside Edmund Clowney, Dr. Clowney, who was on the Central Steering Committee. 
And I said, Dr. Connie, don't you want Charismatics and Pentecostals to sign this? He thought for a minute. He said, what if we say normative revelation? I said, good. <laughs> <laughs> so that word is my input. <laughs> I felt a part of the process. So working late into the night, the Central Steering Committee put in long hours. It, made, it was, none of the people on the committee are alive today. So I, I couldn't talk to anyone who was there, except Stu Weber, a pastor in Oregon, was the teaching assistant for Earl Rodmacher. And he was doing photocopying and running back and forth. And I talked to Stu, and he gave me his memory of it. And Vern Poitras joined the steering committee for the second summit conference, and he gave me his memory of it, and I had my memory of it, and I think it was these people, James Montgomery Boyce, R.C. Sproul, J.I. Packer, Roger Nicole, Edmund Clowney, Robert Price, Earl Rodmacher, Norman Geisler, and Moshe Rosen. By wise guidance, you can raise your war, and in abundance of counselors, there is victory. I think it was a wise steering committee. Enough money, there was adequate funding to pay for travel and lodging for participants who requested it. If my memory is correct, we had to pay for our own lunch, or maybe we had to pay for our own breakfast and lunch. But it was largely uh, subsidized if people requested it. The Billy Graham Evangelistic Association gave $10,000, which would be equal to about $42,000 today. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Eight, some younger scholars were included. 43 mostly unknown young scholars. Ver Vern Poitras, J.P. Moreland is a seminary student. Young faculty members, Vern Poitras, John Feinberg, Robert Godfrey, John Hughes, Alan Coppage, and Wayne Grudem, among others. Well, you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Immediate publication. I think it was published in Christianity Today Harold Lindzell, the editor of Christianity Today at the time, was on the participant list, but I'm not sure if he attended. And Ron Youngblood, the editor of the Journal of the Evangelical Theological Society, was a participant, and he published it very quickly. Number 11, the quality of the final statement. It immediately, it immediately commended itself as a faithful representation of the Bible's teaching about itself. Tone, it contained a tone of humility and graciousness. There's a preface that I didn't, re I, didn't I didn't put on the app for you, but you can look it up. The preface said, we offer this statement in a spirit not of contention, but of humility and love, which we purpose by God's grace to maintain in any future dialogue arising out of what we have said. We gladly acknowledge that many who deny the inerrancy of scripture do not display the consequences of this denial in the rest of their belief and behavior. We are conscious that we who confess this doctrine often deny it in life by failing to bring our thoughts and deeds, our traditions and habits into true subjection to the divine word. Now that tone of humility, I think, was very significant in the uh, outcome of the conference. Um, I'm reminded of uh, something Francis Schaeffer wrote. Francis Schaeffer was part of the split in the Presbyterian Church in the 1920s. And he, looking back on it, said he thought they were still, that the conservatives who broke off from the main Presbyterian Church in the United States were correct. But he said, we forgot to leave with tears. And this set a, a positive tone. Uh, at least it seemed to me, and the scope of the statement. And precision, its affirmations and denials effectively affirmed everything essential to inerrancy and denied all the common evasions of inerrancy. This is my summary of the contents of the uh, articles of affirmation and denial. Number one, the source of authority for scripture is God. Number two, scripture is our supreme authority. Number three, scripture is revelation. Four, human language is adequate. Number five, progressive revelation is not contradictory. Number six, plenary inspiration includes the very words of scripture, not just the ideas. Number seven, the mode of inspiration, how the, how the authors of scripture got their words, got their contents, says is largely remains mysterious to us. Role of human personalities, 
the Holy Spirit did not override their personalities. Finite content, but still entirely true on all subjects, historical, scientific, as well as theological. Ten, inspiration and inerrancy apply to the autographs, the original manuscripts, not all the copies. Number 11, both infallible and inerrant are valid words to describe scripture, but inerrant is the uh, one that is emphasized and most clear. Number 12, truthful on all topics, including science, history, history, science, and creation. There was some push to affirm a young earth, 24-hour days, but it wasn't accepted. Now, I can't remember if that was in the hermeneutics one later on or in this first one, but it said, we have to believe what the Bible says about creation, but it doesn't, the statement doesn't say what the Bible says about creation, just that we have to believe it. Inerrancy is a useful term, qualifications regarding the nature of ordinary language. And we'll look at affirmation 13 because that's, that's really, in some sense, the heart of the statement. Scripture is non-contradictory. Alleged errors do not disprove inerrancy. Inerrancy is taught in the Bible and affirmed by Jesus. Church history affirms inerrancy. Witness of the Holy Spirit, grammatical historical exegesis, internal claims of authorship are true. As if it says it was written by Peter, it was written by Peter. Inerrancy is important, but not necessary for salvation. So the, uh, the scope and the precision and the tone of the statement. My personal conclusion, the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy deserves a place alongside the historic confessions of faith of the church. For that reason, I included it in the appendix to my systematic theology in 1994, along with the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedonian Definition, the 39 Articles of the Church of Concord, <coughs> the Church, Church of England, Westminster Confession of Faith, the Lutheran Formula of Concord, and the Baptist Faith and Message. In the past 27 years since that publication, the Systematic Theology was published, no one has asked me why I included it there with these, other great, with these other great confessions of faith. In the second edition of my Systematic Theology, which you all need to buy, <laughs> uh, in 2020, I kept it there with these great confession of faith, confessions of faith. And I think that is where it belongs.